Ladies and gentlemen, here is Prince. December 1979, Prince Rogers Nelson is making his first appearance on legendary US music show, American Bandstand. Yeah, I mean, this is not the kind of music that comes from Minneapolis, Minnesota. No. <laughs> it's, uh, you're very shy, modest. Interviewed by host Dick Clark, the young wannabe appears completely overawed. How many instruments do you play? Mm. Thousands. Moments will be with it. Thousands? No. One of those watching was his mentor, Pepe Willy. I go, like, what the hell happened to you, man? I'll be yelling at this guy. He says, Pepe, it all hit me at one time. Millions of people are watching me, and he got stage fright. And at that time, he said to me, that will never, ever happen again. Prince in his first motion picture. Five years later, Prince was on the verge of global fame, attending the premiere of a film based on his colourful young life, Purple Rain. Purple Rain, gosh. When he goes on stage and he plays, you just lose yourself. The energy, the music, you just have lift off. The thing about Purple Rain is it was really the first music video movie. He gets down in that film. I mean, he gets down. He's walking music. He is music. Purple Rain set up this dichotomy in his career. Is this a guy who plays stadiums and sells 10 million records? Or is this a musical genius who will follow wherever the inside of his brain takes him? Prince, gifted, outrageous, enigmatic. He captured the imagination of a generation with his diverse mix of musical styles and larger-than-life stage personas. Rock star and funkster, guitar hero and sex god. This is the artist known as Prince. Minneapolis, Minnesota, freezing in winter. It lies on the banks of the Mississippi and is heavily populated by descendants of hard-working Scandinavian settlers. Minnesota was home to wartime sweethearts, the Andrews sisters, and folk legend Bob Dylan, but there wasn't a strong tradition of black music. In 1970, African-Americans made up only 5% of Minneapolis's population. And for the young prince, it wasn't easy to track down the latest releases by his black musical heroes. Minneapolis was hardly a bastion of urban music when Prince was growing up in the 70s. He talks about having gotten to the record store after school on Fridays to get the latest 45s by the Motown artists or James Brown or Funkadelic or whoever else he was into at that particular time. KQ92 is Minnesota's best album rock. Back then, everyone kind of listened to one radio station called KQRS. And so you might be hearing Sly Stone, One Minute, Jimi Hendrix, Carlos Santana, Grand Funk Railroad, Cream, all the cool rock stuff of the era. This is KQRS FM, Twin Cities album station. Has some rock and roll from Led Zeppelin. Wasn't a whole lot of black radio, so we always tended to listen to more pop radio back in the day. and. Uh, you know, it just kind of influenced uh, where, you know, the kind of music that came out of there. Prince was immersed in all this rock and, you know, different things that your normal black kid just ain't around. Well, up here in Minnesota, we were around it all the time. We had no choice, you know. <laughs> Born in 1958, the same year as Michael Jackson and Madonna, Prince Rogers Nelson's life was turned upside down when his jazz pianist father left the family home when he was just eight years old. His mother, a social worker, struggled to keep the family together. Sometimes it snows in April. Prince spent his teenage years living with various friends and family around the city, dreaming of following in his father's footsteps as a musician. I guess when his family broke up, it was a turning point for him that he had to succeed, you know, and maybe he had to try to prove something 
looking for an identity. Who am I? What am I going to become? At 15, Prince was already an accomplished pianist and played guitar in a band called Grand Central. Local musician and producer Pepe Willie went to check them out in rehearsal. I knew he played keyboard as well as guitar. He takes the bass and he starts playing this amazing lick. You know, I mean, just playing. A few weeks later, Pepe was passing Prince's home when he heard a faint sound coming from the house. And Prince is down in the basement playing drums. You know, he played bass, he played drums, he played keyboards. And I'm going like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know. This can't be right, you know. And at that time, I'm in the studio recording with my group, 94 East, okay. So I said, uh, Prince, uh, you know, you got to come to the studio. You ever been in a recording studio? He goes like, no. And we did five songs in four hours. I mean, he was such a professional at such a young age, and it just totally amazed me. It was like a kid in a candy store. As well as mastering different instruments, Prince taught himself basic studio techniques. When he was 17, he recorded some of his own songs at a local studio run by an Englishman, Chris Moon, who played the demo to Minneapolis marketing guru, Owen Husney. He says, it's one kid, he's 17, he's writing everything, playing everything, and singing everything. And I was like, okay, I, I gotta sit down. <laughs> the very first minute that I met Prince, I saw the drive. I could see the fire in his eyes. And while the songs weren't all that great, I definitely heard the quality of the musicianship, the dedication, the passion, the sincerity, it just screamed at me right through the music. Husney secured Prince a free album deal with Warner Records in 1978. The young pretender insisted on being allowed to produce his own music, but first had to prove his studio skills to the label's executives. He walks out and lays down a drum track. Perfect. Goes back in, lays down a bass track. Perfect. A perfect rhythm section was built. About halfway through the song, after he laid down the keyboards and guitars, didn't even get to the vocals yet, they called me out into the, the hallway. We think he's got record sense, and we think he can pull it off. The first album was more of an introduction of here's who I am. You know, the first cut on there, For You, it's an acapella, it's simply fantastic. Even growing up with him and knowing him, he's like people that you see and you go, man, he's so talented, he should be making records. And then, bam, he's making records, and he's playing all the instruments on them, which I thought was amazing. Despite being an impressive technical and creative achievement, the album made little impact on the R&B charts. For you, that's not really pop music. That's saying, look what I can do. And I think he wanted to do that to show, I'm not your average guy. For You was recorded in California, but Prince was single-minded in his determination to build his career from Minneapolis. Prince was determined not to leave. He was determined to stay here and make it. He's joked before that, you know, those long winters keep the bad people out, but it also keeps you in the house composing. So don't underestimate the value of him having stayed here so much of his early career and developing himself as a musician and as an artist. Having played all the instruments on the album himself, Prince now needed a band that could play his music live. And I saw this ad in a local music paper that said, Warner Brothers recording artist seeks guitarist and keyboard player. And uh, I knew that there was only one person within 500 miles that had a Warner Brothers record deal. As the auditions progressed, it was clear this wouldn't be your average R&B or funk band. You had this band that was not only multiracial, but also, you know, men and women in there. It was kind of like uh, Fleetwood Mac meets Sly and the Family Stone. <laughs> The model for Prince's band was late 60s funk legend Sly and the Family Stone, one of the first bands to have a racially integrated multi-gender lineup.
I think he was after putting together a group that could make the crossover in America between black and white music. And I did ask him at one point, why did you hire me? And he said, you got that you're white, you're blonde, you have blue eyes, and you can play funky keyboards. Completing the original lineup of what later became known as a revolution was Bobby Z on drums and Andre Simone on bass. The new band played their first gig at the Capri Theatre, Minneapolis, in January 1979. Prince was very nervous. It was going to be the first time that any of the label execs from Warner Brothers had seen the result of their lab experiment. The first time he was playing with an all-new band. There was definitely star quality. Did I think he was going to be a superstar that night? Too early to tell. But definitely there was a magnetism about him. It was an historic show, but as a show, I would have asked for my money back if it would have been me. <laughs> I thought they were good, but Warner Brothers thought that he wasn't quite ready to go out on tour yet. So he got the band more tight, and uh, by the time the second album came out, he was ready. Prince's self-titled second album was built on the same R&B sound as For You, but his confident swagger behind the mic masked a very different personality. He was obviously very, very, very shy, but at the same time, not awkward or antisocial. The fact is, once you got to know him, he was anything but actually a major practical joker and prankster. He's already acting like a star, but in fact, he was terribly shy, genuinely shy. It wasn't an act. It wasn't an ego thing. He was, he was very much inside. I Wanna Be Your Lover reached the top of the American R&B charts and Prince was invited to perform on the country's number one television music show, American Bandstand. All right. And then Dick Clark comes out and goes, I heard that you play multiple instruments. How many instruments do you play? How many instruments do you play? So I'm waiting for him to answer him and Prince goes, mm -hmm. And the Dick Clark started talking to him, he'd just go, yes. No. Couldn't carry on the conversation. Maybe. Yeah, no, that's it. You're very shy, modest. This very public crisis of confidence proved to be a defining moment in the career of the young artist. See, he couldn't control that. And it scared him to death. And at that time, he said to me, that will never, ever happen again. He came to the band and said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Everyone in the band is going to have a distinct personal image that we're going to project. I am going to just portray pure sex. The trench coat and bikinis, who saw that coming? Not me. He turned heads because of the way he looked, he was diminutive in his stature, he wore heels. My God, who was doing that back then? It was a kind of liberating time in music, in arts anyway. The so-called sexual revolution was kind of peaking and it was just before AIDS brought all of that to a screeching halt. So it, it was kind of the sky was the limit and I think most people who were broad-minded were just you know, bring it on, whatever you got, bring it. 